what are we trying to do? We're trying to bring God's word and people's need together in application. And um, we thought about the difference between... <laughs> hey, well, this is really great fun, isn't it? I'll just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the difference between verse by verse exposition you might look at a passage um, or a book and you would go through that verse by verse or verse with verse exposition um, and uh, in some ways that's a kind of a, a thinking of topical preaching where we um, look at maybe a theme or a topic and we look at what does the Bible say. And that's kind of verse with verse exposition. And so we, we thought about the difference there. But whatever we're doing, it's still exposition, isn't it? Um, because in the end, exposition is to do with dealing with God's word. We're expositing, we're explaining. Um, we're trying to understand what, what God is saying through his word. So whatever we're doing, it's still exposition, bringing God's word, people's need to get an application. We also thought a little bit about how ultimately God calls us not just to fill our minds with information, but actually to see our lives experience transformation. And therefore, as a, as a preacher, application is going to be really important. It's not just a Bible lecture, information. We're, we're thinking about how God wants to transform our lives. And as a preacher, you know, I always kind of think when I'm preparing a message, how does God want to transform my life, first of all, as a preacher? Because actually, you know, the person who lives with this longer is going to be me as the preacher. So, you know, how does God want to transform me through this? And actually, I mean, that's a good point that if you want to preach with passion, then you want to preach a ser sermon, you want to share a word which has impacted you first. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you have spent time studying God's word, meditating upon that, and you feel that you yourself have received a word from God, then actually what you're saying to people is, listen, I want to share with you what God has been saying to me through his word. So it's not just about me, a preacher, telling you stuff. It's about all of us, you know, sitting and living under God's word. So... Um, we're going to be thinking a little bit this afternoon. Let's just think about God's purpose for the preacher. And we're going to be thinking again a little bit about this whole process of exposition. We're going to be doing that as well in the week, but we're going to come back to this thing again and again. Again, whatever style we're preaching, we need to learn how to exposit God's word. God's purpose for the preacher. We are to be bridge builders. Um, and uh, John Stott, I believe in preaching, or uh, Between Two Worlds. It's, a, it's the same book, but different titles. And uh, I recommended you, if you can, listen to a message by John Stott. John Stott is uh, he's dead now, um, but he's a, a really, he was a very gracious man. Um, went to one of the best schools in, in England, came many ways from the, what you would call the ruling government classes. Uh, an absolute intellect but a, a humble man and what I like about John Stott and I still read I, I know you do I read a lot of John Stott um, and I love listening to him he's just very clear very clear we just need clarity uh, and, and that's a, a fantastic characteristic so allsouls.org um, this is what John says he says Preaching is essentially a bridge building exercise. It is the exacting task of re relating God's word to our world with an equal degree of faithfulness and relevance. So we're bringing God's word and people's needs together application. So we're going to have to be aware of two things. We need to understand where people are. But we also need to understand what God's word is saying. And this is a, 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 a demand, uh, which is a great demand. Um, it will demand our imagination and it will demand our intellect. Uh, it will demand our prayers as well. Let's just think a little bit more about this and let's uh, uh, draw uh, a bridge here. 
Uh, I should have done this earlier, uh, really. Let's let's do it under here, okay? So uh, using my fantastically honed artistic and creative skills, I will draw for you a bridge. What kind of bridge? <laughs> It's a bridge which leads from here to there. <laughs> from here to there. Or from there to here. Okay, so let's just, uh, let's just draw this. Okay. There we go. Look at this. Okay. <laughs> right. Let's just think a little a bit about this whole task. Okay, this is a, a big thing, okay, don't underestimate the difficulty involved with this. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with, on the one hand, God's word. That's the then. This is an ancient text. Um, when we deal with the, the gospel, uh, with, with the uh, Bible uh, manuscripts, uh, we're dealing with some of the oldest literature in history. Homer probably is the beginning of a human literature in the sense that we can, I think Homer, we go back to about 2000 BC. Um, but some of the, uh, the, um, the Bible texts really stretch right back. So we're dealing with ancient texts. Now the danger is that we pick up a, a Bible text and we treat it in the same way as we would treat uh, a novel or a, a newspaper article or something which has been written today. Now, what I'm saying is when we look at the ancient text we're going to have to start asking all sorts of questions about that text. Uh, we're going to need to, to start to understand form. What kind of style of literature is this? You, you should have done this in SBS. And the book which you recommended, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, is a really great introduction. Have anyone read, has anyone read that book? Um, it's a really great book, actually. Um, and introduces you with, with de how do we deal with, with Bible books? You know, it, it's a, the Bible is a library. We know that. All sorts of literature. Um, and it wasn't written today. Um, and so um, the, the styles and the concerns and the techniques which people use then might be different to, to, to now. So therefore, if I'm going to understand that, I'm going to have to think a little bit about how did they write in those days. Um, that's the then. Um, so that's the world of the ancient text. Um, this is the now. This is the world, well, it's the contemporary world. The world of the now, 2016. And uh, what we're trying to do is connect the ancient text to the contemporary world. Makes sense, doesn't it? What are we trying to do? God's word, people's need, together in application. Um, and we need to, to fuse these two worlds together. Again, don't underestimate the task here. Um, and, and I think we're going to do that as we, we look at the universal significance. We could spend a lot more time talking about that and, and I'm still trying to struggle um, with maybe a better word than that but, but certainly for now let's, let's use that. What's the universal significance? In other words, what was God saying to those people then um, which we can apply to our world now? Yeah? Does that make sense? Um, so the Bible text is the Word, God's Word, past revelation, then, um, and that's the word of in, world of interpretation. Bible commentators like to live over here. Okay? On the other hand, the contemporary world, the now, that's personalization. And communicators like to live here. You see, note, a preacher is more than just a communicator. We're also going to be Bible commentators too. And, and sometimes um, a communicator, you might have a gifted communicator, 
Um, but actually, they, they know very little about how to read God's word well. Then on the other hand, you get some commentators who know more about the ancient world than they do about the modern world. They, they, they live with their books um, and they, they know more about the Philistines than about their neighbours. Now, <laughs> our calling is to what? Bring God's word, people's need together in application. We're dealing with the, the ancient text of then, and, but we need to look at how we relate that to the contemporary world. The danger and the temptation is to be at either end, yeah? To be at either end. So if you're too much this end, basically it becomes more of a lecture, it becomes more of information. Um, if you're at this end, it, it might be really topical, but actually it doesn't deal with God's word, it just becomes a human speech, yeah? Um, so our task is to bring those two worlds uh, together. So um, the challenge of preaching is to declare eternal truths that never change and apply them in a world that is always changing. Declare eternal truths that never change and apply them in a world that is always changing. And it's not as easy as it seems. It's not as easy as that seems. Acts 13, Paul quoting David in the Old Testament, David served God's purpose in his own generation. The men of Issachar understood the times and knew what Israel should do. So there's that sense of knowing what's God's purpose, what does God's word say to our generation? Um, John Stott in that book speaks about double listening. Or you might have heard the phrase, we read the Bible in one hand with the newspaper in the other. You know, we're, we're trying to bridge this, this gap. God's word, people's need together in application. Um, and I, I suppose, in some ways, there's, there's a question. You know, what are some of the issues of our time? Now, again, these are culturally specific. So, um, you know, we, we think, what are some of the issues of our time? If you speak to young people uh, in, in, in my culture, they would speak about the environment. So environmentalism is, is a big issue, creation care, one of the big issues of our times. Uh, issues to do with poverty, social justice, issues of our time. Um, people's sense of identity in, in a world, a, a, a consumer-driven world. Failure of governments and representation of the people. Big thing. Um, it, that's something which is sweeping Western Europe. You see it in the States at the moment. Um, where people distrust politicians. People distrust people in authority, actually. Which, incidentally, of course, it, you, you could put in my culture, Christians and the church as well. Wouldn't you say that comes from a greater issue where it's uh, the destruction of the family unit and, in particular, that, um, bad representation of fathers? I don't know. I, I, think it's, I think it's complex. Because I think when I, when I think of the church, I think we have not been good models. The church has not been good models. You know, the church has been um, caught in all sorts of scandals. But, sorry, not... You're gone. But doesn't that also come from fathers then? Because you always follow your best yeah. representation of authority, your best model. <coughs> And if you have a good father, if you have a good community around you, it's going to keep you on the straight and narrow. There's going to be the set point of accountability. Yeah, I, 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 what I'm saying is, I don't think there's, you know, there's absolutely one issue. I think there are a number of issues. I think that's one of them. Um, I think that's one of them. I, what I'm saying is, and it goes back to uh, the authority of God's people, um, you know, sometimes people dis, dis, distrust the church. And there'll be some cultures where that's going to be especially the case. They just distrust the church. Um, whether, for all sorts of reasons. So, um, anyway, sorry, that, that's, that's more by way of background. Um, 
four stages of bridge building. Okay, firstly, we study the text. Study the text. That's, that's exegesis. It's observation and interpretation. And so we're asking all sorts of questions. Here are four, or two sets of two. What did it say? What did it mean? So we're thinking of what, what did it say and what did it mean to the original hearers? And then what does it say and what does it mean to us? What did it say? What did it mean? What does it say? What does it mean? So let's just think of just the way I would put a message together. I'm going to be looking at, if I've got a theme, let's just jump to the, the fact that I, I have a theme and I have a number of Bible texts, or maybe one Bible text. So I'm going to be reading that text. Um, I might look at it in different translations first. And I'm asking the question, what did it say, what did it mean? And I will, after reading the text, and, and maybe spending a long time reading the text, maybe look at different translations, I will then look at helps to help me do that. So uh, I would recommend that you, you invest in a good study Bible. Um, and a good study Bible will help you do that. Uh, I um, have over the past year been using the ESV translation and the ESV have a fantastic study Bible. Uh, I was going to bring it here. I, have a, I had a 30 kilo weight limit which enabled me, if I'd wanted to, to bring my big study Bible. It's big, heavy, but I didn't. You have it at home if you, we brought it. You've got one. Yeah, yeah so maybe it's... A, uh, do, do you enjoy that? Do you, yeah. yeah. And I, mean, I have it here at Worcester. Yeah, so um, if, if uh, Jody brings that in tomorrow, you could have a look at that. It's a really great study Bible. Um, and um, uh, there's a lot of information there. It helps me understand maybe some words, maybe some phrases, uh, as, as well as that. I will use commentaries as well. So the most important part of my library back home are commentaries. You know, I have a lot. Um, I measure my library in, in meters. Uh, when it comes to, to bookshelving. In fact, we, my, my wife um, used to write too. She used to write for Scripture Union. Scripture Union involved in South Africa? Scripture, yeah. She used to write for Scripture Union. So she has a library too. So together, uh, we have too many books, really. Um, so um, but, so I'll, I'll, I'll read. I want to understand um, maybe the original languages, phrases, so in the end, I, I'm going to say I understand what the original writers were wanting to communicate and also how the original hearers understood. Now we're going to look at an example of this and we're going to do some stuff maybe tomorrow on the parable um, of the lost son. And we'll look at that and we'll see as we look at that how maybe our understanding of that today might well be different to how original, when people listen to Jesus, how they originally heard that. And what I'm saying is that if you start to look at what other people, other scholars have written, that will just give you a much deeper understanding of what God's Word is saying. And I just love doing that. Um, so I, I will study the text uh, what did it say? What did it mean? What does it say? What does it mean now? And I can tell you something, you know, if you do that, if you, if you preach on a certain passage and you do that, then you will have so much material. Sometimes, you know, I think, oh, I've got, I need to prepare for one message here. But in the end, I, I, I end up doing two messages because I, I just can't compress it into one. It's just so much. And that's the joy. And all I can say is the thrill of studying God's Word. Very few people study God's Word. They read it, but they don't study it. And, and I think the calling of a preacher is to be a student, to study God's Word. Within studying, do you mean taking time off for contemplation? 
Contemplation is part of that, and we'll, we'll think about that over the next couple of days. So um, there are two elements to that. There's both there's the academic work, but there's also meditation on that. But we'll, we'll deal with that. Um, but we've actually started to encourage our, our... My church is in a what I would call a working class area. And we've just been telling people, you just need to get into studying God's Word. And we're selling in our bookstore commentaries now, which is really cool. And, and these are people who are not used to necessarily, it's not a bookish, bookish culture, but people are starting to buy simple basic commentaries. Get into God's Word. Um, and that's, it's just the thrill. Um, and in some ways, it's, do you know with a pump, you know the old fashioned pumps? You used to have to prime it. You, you know, there is a phrase, isn't it? Pump, uh, prime the pump. And what you used to do to create the, the vacuum, so you had to pour some water in the pump first before it worked and we're all different here but I think that when you do a bit of reading like that sometimes it gives you inspiration it pump it primes the pump and you'll read something which someone has written you think oh wow and then you think that gives you all sorts of other ideas um, th the other expression is that um, I might be I might be a midget, I might be very short, but I can stand on the shoulders of giants. Have you heard that phrase? Mm -hmm. And I can access um, 2,000 years of the best of Christian writers. And that means I can stand on their shoulders. Wouldn't I be foolish not to take advantage of that? So I would encourage you, um, you know, learn to stay, and you will start to, un you will start to, to get used to the tools which you would have at your disposal. I think a study Bible is a good start, but I realize, now, a lot of things you can get online now. You can buy commentary series online. Now, I, I'm a bit of a dinosaur, so I like books. And because I don't travel for most of the time, I can have my books. But obviously, with yourselves, if you're on the move, um, you can access stuff online and you can buy stuff online and it is an investment i encourage people and um, this is a financial investment too for me when it comes to books i might be slightly weird here but i would put the expenditure on tax number one i've got to pay tax i have to pay my bills i have to eat and then I can buy books. So I would kind of put it really high up on the list. Um, but again, you know, you can, you can buy so many resources online and that, that's worth an investment. When you have some money, you might want to think about how can I invest in, in some resources and you can um, get those online. Perhaps I can show you afterwards some of the things I, I might use. Okay, and maybe if you could bring in that book tomorrow. So that's the, that's the study, the text. That's the. We'll, we'll look at this again. Secondly, find the universal significance. What's the implication? What's the big picture here? What's the big story? You know, what's the connection here? I'll give you an example. Um, I, I talked a little bit in September. I did a, a, a three-part series on John. And uh, what I do... Now, again, I know it's really strange, but in the olden days... Um, people used to use what, what's called paper and a pen. Look, there we go. Now, I know that people use computers now, but what I do, um, I, I use these notebooks. Now, you can use a computer because you're also young and hip and trendy, and that's what young and hip and trendy people do. I use a notebook. Um, and so what I do, um, I, I, all my study, I, I'll just make notes. And actually, I think some of my notes, preparatory notes for John are in here as well. Um, and I don't know about you, the problem with, with computers, okay, I, it might be a grumpy old man, is um, it's, it's basically storing things. And I'm not talking about for weeks and months. I'm not even talking about years. I'm talking about decades. So I, can, I have notebooks going back many years, and I, I can actually still retrieve them. So my concern with computers is, it's actually a, a, a bigger issue about um, keeping material for long periods of time. We, we still have to see, it, it's possible obviously, 
but we still have to see how it pans out. But anyway, whatever. So, okay, so I looked at John, I did all the study, um, and, and then what I did, I, I kind of stepped back, the, my, I, I used Don Carson's commentary on John, I used, I think, uh, did John Stott do it? I used a number of commentaries on John, uh, as well as, um, so that gave me a real understanding of what the text said. But then, I, I wanted to kind of get a handle on this um, for my people, and, and what I came up with was, was looking at, um, from John chapter 2, um, so we're dealing with um, after Jesus had cleansed the temple, and what I, th this was the outline for three weeks. Um, lots of people went to Jesus, but when they went to Jesus, um, it, it, their faith was not good enough. So the first thing, that, that people had a suspicious faith. And, and those were the people who went to Jesus and said, what authority, what, give, what authority have you got to do these things? He just cle cleansed the temple. Um, and they said, what authority have you got to do these things? People with a suspicious faith, and it was all about authority. What gives you the right to tell me what to do? That's what they were saying. What, Jesus, what gives you the right to cause all of this fuss in the temple? And uh, that's a common thing today, isn't it? So Jesus, what gives you the right to tell me what to do? Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing was uh, people um, with a superficial faith. Um, because it said, actually, uh, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. These were people with a superficial faith. They believed not for who Jesus was, but because they saw the signs. In other words, it, it was the kind of exterior things. They saw the signs, but it wasn't really about the identity of Jesus. So people had a superficial faith. And then Nicodemus was someone who had an inadequate faith. It didn't get him there. And, and so, in some ways, those three ideas seem to connect with all sorts of opinions and views, and people even in my congregation. And, and that came out of studying the text, and it gave me a way in. So each of those three weeks, we looked at people with suspicious faith, people with a... Um, uh, what did I say? The third one was inadequate faith. Superficial, superficial faith. And, and that gave me a handle, and it gave me a point of connection with where people were. Can you see that? But that takes a bit of time to do that. Um, and, and, it's that and that's that Holy Spirit thing. As we do the work, but then we trust the Holy Spirit is going to give us understanding as well. Okay. So, find the universal significance. Three, think of your audience, contextualization. God's word, people's need to gather and applicate. What's the, who am I speaking to? Here are six things. This is a Rick Warren thing, actually. Six things I know about every audience. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants their lives to matter. No matter how wealthy or successful, life is empty without Christ. Now, they might not feel that, but I, that is a conviction from the gospel. Life is empty without Christ. For many of these people are carrying a load of guilt. Many are consumed with bitterness over past hurts. And there is a universal fear of death. But actually, I think there is, there is something else which I have observed. So I'm going to throw this out, and you will have to make of it as you would. I think within our churches, and I'm speaking about my context in the Western world, might be different here, but this is my reflection upon my context, my culture. There is a new context. Firstly, people often think that old modes of church absolutes are no longer trusted goes back to this thing of authority someone standing up in church saying um, this is the truth 
There's a deep distrust of that within our culture. And I guess in many of our churches too, people might not admit it, but I kind of guess it's there, even in what I would call traditional Bible-believing churches too. Secondly, there is pluralism within the local congregation. So that means standing up and just saying, thus saith the Lord, do this. Well, it might make me feel happy and it might make some of the older people feel happy. But I'm just wondering out of my experience whether that's going to connect with everybody now. When you say pluralism, are you talking about people who think that all world roads lead to God or yes. you know, that everyone all, goes to heaven? All the research shows this is from the States, that even in Bible-believing churches, good evangelical churches, there is a far greater, if you scratch below the surface, there is a far greater sense of pluralism than a, a preacher might credit. Um, and I'm, make sure that everyone here understands. Yeah, so, so that, um, yeah, there, there might be all sorts of ideas within that church. There might be a, many people who think there are many ways to God. There'll be many people uh, who ha would have different views um, of, of sexuality as well, as a big one. Um, they won't say, often they won't say what they really think, but actually the research, I don't know if you've seen some of the research, um, would bear this out. What I'm saying is that the preacher needs to know that. That helps me communicate. Um, not everyone, go on. How would you figure that out? Would you just ask people questions and get to know them? Yes. And also, I just know where the culture is going to. I think we need to have a, a great sense of, of where the culture is going. Um, and if that's happening, and there's a lot of research in, in American evangelical churches, if that's happening in American evangelical churches, in Bible-believing areas, then that's going to be everywhere, I think. There's a great book by Tim Keller called Center Church. And in the context of that book, there is a really great section on how Christians interact with culture. I would recommend that book. Could you, sorry, could you maybe give me another example with pluralism, something like that? Okay. Um, actually, this is something affecting YWAM too. Okay, we would have certain assumptions, okay? As an example, so we would have certain assumptions about sexuality, human sexuality. Um, we would um, talk about um, sex as a, a gift given by God to be used within marriage. We would just, that's, that's a biblical view. And we would also um, look at human sexuality and say that actually um, um, it is not God's best um, uh, uh, homosexual relationships are, are just not God's best. That's not God's plan. Okay? Now, I don't think now, when I speak to a big group of people, I can make those assumptions. Now, I know that's also an, an issue affecting YWAM too. So that even in YWAM, some of those issues are coming up, aren't they? The, um, I know that bases have had issues with these. That the sort of expectations we would have a sexuality is one example, but it's, it's, it's a big example. Um, we would have certain assumptions and expectations. They might not be shared. And that's, that's the issue. And I need to know that as a preacher. Um, and rather than just say, this is what God says, go and do it. Um, I might need to actually argue that case a little bit more clearly from Scripture. And to say, this is what God's word says, and this is why it says it, actually makes sense. I hope you understand that. We're not taking things for granted. So that's the problem. Sometimes preachers take things for granted. Is, is it in the case of compromising? Or not go so deep and go just shallow? In what way? An example that you gave right now, I'm trying to understand. He's trying to... Help us to understand our audience, I think. Yeah, it's understanding the audience. Yeah, yeah um, the my people, question is about the plur pluralism. Yeah. Uh, what is... What is pluralism? No, I think what the is classic the example, pluralist man? question would be... Uh, Generalize. Like, uh, 
would a loving God send, why would a loving God send everyone to hell? Yeah. Or send anyone to hell? Or, you know, they think that everyone should go to heaven because God is law. That would be sort of the classic 30 years ago. Plan. Well, it's not 30 years ago because actually Rob Bell, yeah. uh, the whole Rob Bell thing, that, that's come up again yeah. within a, the American uh, scene. Yeah. So, um, I'm just saying that we sometimes assume we know what people think. Just be careful, don't make those assumptions. Um, what um, Tim Keller speaks about is when he preaches, he puts in what he calls um, toolbar. You know, um, on, a, um, on a page, you might have a toolbar on your computer. And uh, he puts in toolbars into his messages where at least one of the points he will be explaining this as if he's speaking to an, a non-Christian. So he says, this is the reason. These, these are why we believe these things. Does that make sense? It's not just assuming that everyone's going to say, believe this. He will explain why Christians believe these things. Um, it's a really very clever way of preaching. Um, what I'm saying is just don't assume things which aren't there um, because sometimes our assumptions are, are, are not correct. Um, anyway, I'm just kind of saying that because I think in the West that's a, an increasing reality now. Even, even in evangelical um, Bible-rooted churches. And that influences me. Now, actually, if I think, if I know that, then, then sometimes that means I can, we'll look at this later on, but it means I can start addressing some of those questions which people have. So if I'm, I'm preaching on something, I might look at a text, like the, the thing about, you know, when the, the religious leader said to Jesus, what gives you the authority to, to, to do this? Um, and Jesus, Jesus' answer was, um, my authority is that I will destroy the temple um, and in three days I will rebuild it again. You know that text? Mm -hmm. Now actually, that suspicion, I think, I, I, and I, I talked about that, I, I always said, you know, I, I can understand there are various people, they are very suspicious about religious extremism, of people making what seem to be really bold religious you know, in the West, that's a big issue. Um, is Islamic terrorism um, is a big issue. And so people are very conscious of this. Um, so you can understand why people, there's people said to Jesus, what gives you the authority? You're, you're, you, you, you claim this authority. What? So we looked at that and I, we got underneath that and actually Jesus' answer started to explain some of those things, but I'm trying to get in the mind of my listeners, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Um, four, ap apply the truth to their situation, personalization. A and I think this is, this is going to be the secret in communication. We apply God's word, God's word together, bringing people's needs together in application. And you, you make it so as if you're speaking into people's lives. Now that's a Holy Spirit miracle thing. You know, um, this is the preacher's thing, and, and if it hasn't happened to you already, it will do. Someone will come up to you and say, oh, when you were preaching, it was as if you were preaching just to me. <laughs> yeah? And that's a Holy Spirit thing. A sovereign work of God. But I think it's also a sense of <coughs> how we apply the truth. To people's situations. Yeah. Um, why aren't sermons built around applications? We'll do this very quickly. We assume people will make the necessary connection. Again, two preachers make too many assumptions. We assume people will make necessary connections. Here's another one. This sounds good. We leave it to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will make the connections. And, and, and that's Mart Martin Lloyd-Jones, who I really love. He would say that. Karl Barth, one of the most important theologians of the 20th century, would say the same thing too. Um, we leave it to the Holy Spirit. A 
apart from the fact is when you open the New Testament, you see that a great deal of the New Testament is application in itself. So that must tell us something. A personal application is convicting and makes people uncomfortable. Hmm. Sometimes um, it will be convicting. Not condemning, that's, you know, there's now no condemnation. It's Satan condemns, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts. Because we haven't got it in our lives. We haven't got it in our lives. Listen, yeah. if I'm doing a series on relationships on a Sunday morning and I have a massive row with my wife on a Saturday night, uh, that's not a great, you know, I'm standing up there and she's sitting there looking at me and I'm preaching and she's thinking, hmm, it's... <laughs> Uh, because it takes more time and effort in preparation. It just takes more time and effort, this. Um, here's another one. We're afraid of being simplistic. To explain simply, I need to understand profoundly. And to understand profoundly, I need to explain simply. And if I don't communicate simply, I simply don't communicate. <laughs> Seven, because we've never been taught how to do it. And then we haven't realized the importance of it. The danger of teaching information without application, this is interesting, knowledge without application produces pride. Knowledge without application produces pride. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. And knowledge without application also brings judgment. Anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. So, how much of a sermon should be application? Okay, let's just look at some examples. Okay, these aren't my figures, so some New Testament examples. Paul Romans, which is the most systematic theological book we have in the New Testament. Um, but some people would think 50% of that is application. There is a lot of application in Romans. Ephesians, 50% application. Galatians, 100% application. James, 80%. 1 Peter, 60%. Sermon on the Mount, 90%. But actually, interestingly, when you read the scriptures, you get this incredible joining of doctrine and application. And, and it's a marvellous thing to read how the New Testament speaks about God, it speaks about the kingdom, not in dry, formal, academic ways, but in ways which apply to our lives. And, and that's, that's good to notice. Philippians 2, um, that passage about Jesus, um, almost certainly taken from an early Christian hymn, um, we have some really rich theological teaching about the identity of Jesus. And yet, of course, the context is application. It, it was put down there to apply to our lives, although it contains incredible doctrinal truth. So I, what I'm saying is, we, we bring the, it's how we bring these things together. God's word, people's need together in application. Now we're going to stop there. We're going to pause, and we're going to have a break. Um, and then we'll look at um, something, we'll look at Psalm 100. So we'll be a little bit more interactive.